Hello, Sam's fans, and welcome again to Facebook Live. Per usual, we do these broadcasts every Wednesday at 3 p.m., and we bring in music therapists, art therapists, and a bunch of other personalities to talk about a lot of really exciting things. And I'm really happy to have today Kristen O'Grady uh, joining us, and we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff. Kristen is a music therapist, board certified, and she's a New York State licensed creative arts therapist with extensive experience in pediatric palliative care. She's the director of creative arts therapists, therapies at Elizabeth Seton Pediatric, well, Children's Center, right? That's, and the vice president of the American Music Therapy Association. So thank you for joining us and I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. And so we're going to be talking about a bunch of things today. And just to anybody watching, I want to say, as usual, you can drop comments, questions, or anything, and we'll do our best um, to answer. Or just you can say hi. We always are happy to see who's joining us and who's watching. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking now, I didn't put this in the questions that I sent you beforehand, but I'm just wondering if you can give us a little bit about your background, where you studied and kind of why, how you got into music therapy. Sure. So um, I consider myself one of the lucky people who uh, learned about music therapy um, in high school. Uh, so I actually have um, both uh, my bachelor's and my master's in music therapy. Um, I first learned about music therapy um, when I was in band class. Uh, we had an alumni of the uh, high school uh, came with her clarinet teacher from her college. Um, and they were just, you know, talking about the university that she attends and the music department, and they listed all of the majors, you know, music education, composition, all that. And then they say music therapy. And I said, well, wh what's that? And they said, well, we don't know, but we have it. Um, and then, the, you know, as a lot of people, you know, the term is really intriguing. So um, I then, you know, started to do some some looking into it and, and found out that this really seemed to be exactly a good fit for me. So I have my bachelor's uh, from Montclair State University in music therapy, as I said, and then my master's from uh, New York University in music therapy. That's awesome. And um, so after that, did you go right into hospitals or what did you do? So after my bachelor's, I began working um, in a division of where I am now. So we have uh, within our organization, we have a school. Uh, so I started working for our school uh, that services the children that we have here who are inpatient. Mm -hmm. um, and I was working there for about a year and a half before I started my master's. And I transitioned uh, from our school. So I started in the school in 2004, and then I transitioned we say upstairs into the, the pediatric center, the more medical part of our center um, in 2008. Okay, that's awesome. So now that we started to talk a little bit about the center, can you tell us a bit uh, about this Elizabeth, Se is it Seton? That's Seton, it? yeah. yeah. Seton uh, Children's Center. How, how does music therapy work there? How many music therapists are there and so on? Sure. So we've been super fortunate to grow our program. So when I began in 2004, we had our first music therapist in the center. Uh, and now we have a total of, of eight music therapists, including myself. Um, and we have a music therapists essentially per uh, neighborhood, which are what we call our, our nursing units where the children are uh, reside. Um, and we take care of children from birth through 21 who have uh, complex medical needs, uh, who have passed the acute phase of their illness. So um, they likely were in the hospital at some point, probably for an extended period of time. Um, and then they need extended post acute care. So we will take we you know, receive children um, who are a little, not so much in their crisis moments, um, but certainly do need this kind of continuing care. Um, so some of our babies come from the NICU uh, to us, and then some of our older children maybe have had um, uh, accidents or other kinds of um, exacerbations of their conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, 
so you have the eight music therapists there. Is that full time or part time? And yes, everyone is full time, and oh. I'm I am one of the, uh, I counted myself, but I have mostly an administrative role at this point. Okay. Yeah, but that's eight music therapists. That's a good number. So I'm it's really a pretty happy. good number. <laughs> We're really yeah. happy with that number. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and just seeing with our partner hospitals. Um, I mean, some of them didn't have music therapy before we we kind of started collaborating with them, and now they do. But it's always we hear about the need for more music therapy. The you know that you have hundreds of kids in these huge hospitals like Nationwide Children's and Cincinnati Children's, and you only have a handful of music therapists. So uh, I'm also wondering at Elizabeth Seaton's if. If you also feel like there is a need, or if, or if you've been lucky to get pretty good at covering what, what you need. Right now, I feel like we're in a really good spot. So each mm -hmm. of our, our neighborhoods has between 20, actually between like 16 to 24 children, depending on the neighborhood. So we basically have one mm -hmm. therapist per about 20 kids. And that's pretty okay. amazing, I think. So it is. every single child uh, who we take care of has the opportunity to uh, receive music therapy, either individual, group, or both. Um, and, you know, we've built it over time. We've built it mm -hmm. by, you know, some of it is luck and some of it is is really just, you know, continuing to show up and to take risks and, and try different things and see what's a match for this environment. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And is this mostly the hospital supporting it or do you also have other outside organizations who come in and support? Mostly the hospital. So we are, um, our department is funded by the hospital budget, um, but okay. we also rely on grant funding uh, for special projects. So yeah. we, yeah. you know, we've been very fortunate to have, um, you know, donors to come in to help us purchase some, make some large instrument purchases or other types of things that we're looking to start. Yeah. Wow. That's that's definitely wonderful to hear. And hopefully, you know, at, at our partner hospitals one day we can also say like we're covered. We have one music therapist for twenty kids. That would be amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. It's definitely yeah. possible. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I know that we also wanted to talk about access to pediatric palliative care, and that also goes along to what we were saying, right? Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are, I guess, in terms of where you are located right now. And I'm not sure if you have any, I've had any time of looking at the general um, state of pediatric palliative care in the greater scheme around the United States, but I'm just curious about what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so I think it's we're a, it's a slow growing area in terms of just getting the word out. I think most people mm -hmm. still would, when they think palli palliative care, they think end of life or they think hospice, and they kind of put the things mm -hmm. together, um, which creates a stigma. Uh, especially when we're talking about kids, because most people who have kids who are really sick don't really want to have a lot of discussions about the end of, of their lives because that's, I mean, that's the, not the, that's the worst part. That's not the thing that we really want right. to be talking about. Um, but what palliative care offers is so much more than, than end of life care, which is mm -hmm. a component at, you know, at times, but it's really thinking about how do we help children and their families to live the lives that they want to live while also receiving the care that they need for the condition that they have. Um, and so when we widen that net, I mean, that's really the way that care should be provided all the time for, for kids and for people with chronic conditions. Um, but, you know, as these two things are kind of like tied together, end of life and, and palliative care, um, we kind of don't always get kids to onto palliative services in larger hospitals um, earlier when we could really be doing aggressive symptom management. We could be really affecting uh, change in their quality of life, um, connecting them with these services that they might need either in the hospital or in the community. And yeah. so at Elizabeth Seaton, our philosophy is a palliative philosophy. Um, so we have some advantages there because we kind of are infusing palliative philosophy and approach into all of the care that we're providing because we're assuming that every child we take care of 
has the potential for an impacted quality of life because of their condition. Um, yeah. And so when we're approaching them, we are educating our staff on all different levels of the organization, what their role is from a palliative philosophy, whether it's a person mm -hmm. who is making their bed in the morning and, and arranging the stuffed animals in the way that they like them or adjusting the blinds in the way that wouldn't be in their eyes because they can't roll over by themselves, or the sun wouldn't be in their eyes. Um, mm -hmm. Or it's a person um, being very creative in pain management, um, so, you know, in order to make sure that the child can uh, get to a group that they really like or something like that. So all of those things kind of coming together to create, you know, through innovation, creativity, um, mm -hmm. and a commitment to quality of life. And that's the kind of care that we're looking to provide on a universal basis. Definitely. Yeah, that's great. And we've we've had some conversations about palliative care here before. Uh, we have one blog post out. And one of the positions that we fund is actually a music therapist providing palliative care um, also in Columbus, in the Columbus area. But she actually goes to the homes of some of these kids and helps them out. And um, so it's definitely something that we're also trying to fight. This is stigma, stigma of palliative care. So um, I think it's it's good how I can see that you over there, um, you're doing something to fight it. And we are also trying to help out. So maybe, you know, the situation gets better. And again, I don't know in the whole United States or I'm personally from Mexico, right? So I know also that we lack a lot of these services in Mexico. And, but it's important to also be able to provide this for kids, right? Especially because in, I, I cannot imagine, you know, in at, at such a young, young age having to deal with these diseases, right? So I think that's, that's really important. Yeah, and I think, you know, the more that we get to know families and the more that we know what's important to them, and the same with children, the more that we get to know what's important to children, as we're nearing the end of someone's life, we can seamlessly infuse those aspects that we already know that they are important to them mm -hmm. as we're having conversations that are more difficult, like progressively more difficult conversations. We can approach those conversations sensitively and from a place that they would be able to receive uh, so that we can help both the family and the child to have the uh, end of life experience that would be optimal for them. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I was gonna also ask you about what's the important uh, part or the important role of music therapy in pa pediatric palliative care, which I think you've all already covered part of it, but I'm also wondering if you can talk about how you use music in, in these cases. Yeah, well, specifically, um, you know, when we work with families, I mean, some of the work is, legacy work specifically. So I, whether it's capturing recordings either through, you know, um, voice of the child and their families, creating collaborative recordings, maybe heartbeat recordings, things like that. Um, but I think a lot of it is um, engaging in experiences where something is being created, you know, and we're having a lot of conversations about what will end and what where, where the loss is. And in music therapy, it's constantly creating, it's constantly new. Something is existing that didn't exist before. Um, and so when we enter into music with a child or with their family, that's what we have the opportunity to do. And those experiences will, will stay, will stay forever um, with, with yeah. the family. Um, and then when we're in a and when we're, we've had a relationship with a family and we're moving into an uh, end of life situation, um, you know, I think we have the opportunity then to create an environment which will help the family to experience this, like the worst day in a different, in a different way. Um, the most yeah. optimal version of, of what it is that they're experiencing. Um, you know, and I liken it sometimes, and other people have too, to having a movie with the sound off or versus the sound on. I think there's a huge mm -hmm. difference. And the skill there is, the clinical skill is to be able to read the environment musically and create some sort of, um, and, and kind of create a health, health from that environment by introducing music into it. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine how sensitive you have to be because you're, 
coming into this space where there is obviously a lot of tension, a lot of grief, a lot of people not sleeping, right? And then right. you're here like, you cannot just come and play a jolly old song, like like it's nothing, right? You have to be really sensitive and figure out what, where the patient and where the families are. Absolutely. How you can, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. And sometimes, you know, it's environmental, as I said. And then, as we said, as it, what you just said made me think of a, a moment when we did have a family that asked uh, the therapist to sing if you're happy and you know it, which is such mm -hmm. a strange thing to ask for in a moment that felt like incredibly heavy and sad. But then to, yeah. to know this family was to know that they had had this shared experience with their child. Mm -hmm. where this song would always help the child smile and it was something that they shared. Yeah. So being able to then create this, you know, one more time of them sharing this song together, even though it felt strange to sing about feeling happy in that moment right. was incredibly important to, to be able to bring yeah. that in. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, you also wanted to talk about something that I feel is it's really interesting. So you mentioned community music therapy work in pediatric long-term uh, care. And I'm just wondering because usually I feel that issues of illness, of you know, end of life, it's really private. It's, it feels a, a, um, a lot of times. And I'm just wondering how that could be incorporating in, into a community music therapy. So we care for kids for a longer time usually than in the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have essentially a community that develops within the environment, within the organization. So as I said in my language before, we use the word, we even use the word neighborhood to describe the units that the children live on, which I think is, is popular in a lot of hospitals as well. Mm -hmm. So um, within that, if we are just looking at providing a service to the child in and out, coming in, coming out, we're not taking into account the wider array of uh, factors that are kind of woven together that are influencing mm -hmm. health. And so when we think about the community, we think about the health of the community and how it affects the health of the individual, the two are just, they're linked. Um, and so what we have um, really resonated with community music therapy principles in how we provide not just groups, but also our individual sessions. So we're not really apt to um, try to change the environment by, you know, closing the door or art like artificially, but really thinking about, well, this is, the music is now existing in the space where the child is, right? And, and so we are embracing all of the people moving through, we're embracing the different noises, um, and we're inviting people to be themselves within the group space. Um, so with the group context, um, we see people of all different levels of the organization who naturally come into the group, not because they're facilitating yeah. for a child, you know, helping them play or something like that, but they're coming as themselves. And we're inviting people as themselves to sing or play instruments and to be an integral part of the group because they're an integral part of the community. So even someone walking by is influenced by the presence of the music therapy group in the space and they carry that yeah. with them as they go and, and provide care to the next child that they see. And so mm -hmm. we think about how the presence of the music in the space ripples out into the community. Um, and sometimes that is, you know, results in performance, something performative, often it doesn't, um, but it is very public, the way that the, our groups happen. Sometimes they're large uh, and, and they're pretty engaging, I think. Okay, so when you talk about these people kind of passing by and, and these groups being a bit more public, is that still um, within the facilities of the center or? Yes, so the way that our neighborhoods are set, um, the community space um, where a lot of the groups happen is kind of like when you enter into the unit, when you enter into the neighborhood, you'll, okay. there, it's like a, community space. So children will come into the community space, staff as well, therapists, families, mm -hmm. you know, nurses kind of walking by. Um, 
And so everybody is witnessing it, whether they chose to come in, you know, they intended to come or they just happened to be kind of moving through. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. And is there any um, research you are aware of on, on this sort of idea of community music therapy or any, anything that maybe has been done there at the center? We have not done research on this specific topic, although it's certainly mm -hmm. research of ours. Um, we yeah. have been consumers of literature um, mm -hmm. to inform some of the things that we found ourselves doing naturally uh, to try yeah. to kind of, you know, voice, give voice to some of the things that we are seeing. Um, I know you spoke with Dr. Agan um, mm -hmm. as well. You know, the the, the kind of work that has been done foundationally has, while it's not quite the same, it has heavily influenced us in the way that we uh, view what's happening in front of us. Definitely. Well, that's that's a really interesting idea and an, an interesting way of approaching it. So I, I'm really glad that you're able to share that with us. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Now, um, I also wanted to talk to you about the AMTA. So you're the vice president right now. Correct. Um, so can you, I think most of our viewers by now should know about the American Music Therapy Association. They've heard us talk a little bit about that. And we've had a couple of blog posts about that. Um, so can you maybe just tell us a bit about what you do as the vice president and how you see things over there at the AMTA? Sure. So the primary role of the vice president is to be the program chair for the national conference. Um, in addition to being a voting member of the board and serving on the board in various committees or work groups or other other tasks assigned to the board. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, being the program chair takes up a lot of time. Um, we select the general theme for the conference. We solicit the uh, proposals. Uh, we review all of the proposals for concurrent sessions and continuing education sessions. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we try to uh, narrow it down. The, the, the hardest job, I think, is narrowing it down uh, to try to create a program which we think will appeal to a wide array of music therapists and music therapy students, um, mm -hmm. which you know is, is cutting edge and um, speaks to, you know, emerging topics. Um, and uh, then, you know, we host the, the conference in November. Um, as I said before, as a voting member, um, I participate in all of our board discussions and votes. Um, we have been very, very busy. Um, this board in particular, I think, has met the most of, um, as I'm, I'm told, of any board uh, before us. So we meet uh, via video call uh, every month. Um, previous boards have met as needed and then um, midterm and annual conference as well. Um, but we have been mm -hmm. meeting monthly and uh, we just had our mid-year meeting in uh, June and then we'll have another meeting again in um, our long-term, me our long meeting in November. Yeah. Our, our biggest job right now um, is we um, are supporting the transition committee uh, as they are working through their search for our newest, our next executive director. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in your question about what can we expect, I think we can expect um, change. We can we can absolutely mm -hmm. expect change. We've we've been um, going through a period of transition uh, for several months, probably more than a year, um, and we definitely will have more change to come. And changes, you know, I think we feel you will feel differently about change at different times, but you know, perhaps there's some excitement there too to see what might be next for AMTA. Definitely. Anything we we should be looking forward um, at the conference this year? So this year we have um, a number of exciting, well, we always have exciting presentations. I'm really proud of the program. Um, the program just went live, I think, yesterday. So everybody can check, feel free to check it out. Um, some things that we have uh, in store, um, we have um, a conference chair present series, which will be highlighting innovative work being done in our field. Um, so people can look for that. They there is also um, a, let me think, there's a, our opening night, uh, 
our opening night musical act, Galen Lee. She was a Tiny Desk concert winner in 2016, I believe, from NPR. We're really excited to host her um, as our opening act. Um, I think that there's just so much packed into that program um, that hopefully that there's something for everybody. Um, as always, though, I you know people have been very generous in reaching out and giving their feedback and asking questions, um, and I'm always available for that. I think sometimes there's uh, you know different information out there about how conferences come together, and I'm also available to answer those questions if anybody has any. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you. And at the end, I always love asking um, whoever I have here and my interviewees. I like to ask for stories, so I'm, I'm wondering if you have any stories you would like to share with us. Uh, sure, yeah, I have one that I would love to share. It's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was really um, just beginning uh, this work, uh, I was working with uh, a little baby who was nearing the end of his life. Uh, and I had been working closely with him and his mother um, over some, some weeks. And it was my very first time being so closely, um, so, so close to uh, a, a child in this situation. Um, and I was, you know, a little nervous about, about how it would feel. And um, I was, I remember being at the bedside of the baby and the mom was there as well. And the baby started having a breathing pattern, which is very common towards the end of someone's life. And it made me nervous. It was the first time I had seen it. And I turned to the doctor who was working um, with his family. And I kind of quietly said, like, you need to do something. Like, please do something. And he said, I can't, but you can. Hmm. And it was the most powerful thing um, that he could have said in that moment. And it really uh, made an impact on me. And yeah. it kind of also snapped, you know, snapped something in me, to, you know, woke me up to say, oh, right, I do know this family and I, I do know this baby and I do know what I could do right now. Um, and I still work with this doctor and I tell him all, a lot that he, that moment was so influential for me. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. And it's great because we, we always think, or there's this assumption, I guess, from from people who might not even know much about music therapy. They said like, okay, well, doctors can do obviously a lot of things that music therapists cannot, but also to hear that there are a lot of things that music therapists can do that doctors can, it's definitely very empowering. Yeah. Thank yes. you for sharing that, yeah. My pleasure. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions. Um, and we're nearing the end here. Anybody watching, feel free to ask or comment anything. This is your last chance. But yeah, I, I think you just left to say thank you for joining. And I don't know if there's anything else that was left unsaid that you would like to say. No, I just thank you for this opportunity. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Definitely awesome. And again, um, Sam's fans, thank you for joining. And every Wednesday at 3 p.m., we have this broadcast. This might be changing a little bit in the future broadcast because I'm, I'm gonna be doing an internship in music therapy actually. So, Congratulations. Um, I'm, thank you. So I might have to move the broadcast to a different time. So if any of you watching has a suggestion for a time that you would like to have this on, definitely let us know and we'll see what we can do. Um, but yeah, we have some really exciting people coming for interviews in the future. So stay tuned and we'll communicate through Facebook, Instagram, and email. And again, thank you, Kristen, for joining us and for sharing all, all that wisdom that you have. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, and then, so till next time. <laughs>